How's it going, Jackie? It's great to get you on the podcast finally. It's uh I feel like it's been a while, but you know, I'm really excited for our conversation today. Yeah, super happy to be here. It's uh it's beautiful out in Arizona, so it's a nice day. I'm in a good mood. <laughs> oh, I know. My a, a good friend of mine moved to Arizona maybe a year and a half ago. And now he always gives us updates like Oh, you know, it's a little bit chilly today. It's 60 degrees, you know, like, man, yeah. you can, you can leave me alone. It's, it's negative 20 where I'm at. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in New Hampshire and for the first 10 years I lived in New Hampshire, I lived in a little town called Berlin, which is about 45 minutes in Canada. So I have oh, wow. definitely walked to school in like negative 10, negative 15 temperatures before I empathize with you. <laughs> yeah. Never when again, I was... but... <laughs> Yeah, when when I was in college, actually, uh, you know, I worked for the the police department, the campus police department, and it was like negative 40. And uh, I was one of like five or 10 people that had to actually go in as like essential personnel. And which was crazy because they had a a student be an essential personnel. And the the uh, police chief actually sent a squad car to my dorm to to pick me up. Because he said that it was too unsafe for me to walk a quarter of a mile. Yeah. Yeah, I, I believe that. Um, the thing that finally broke me was we had an ice storm in 2008 in New Hampshire that left an inch and a half of ice on everything in New Hampshire. And oh. I didn't have power for six or seven days. And I lived in Manchester. I didn't live in like nowhere in New Hampshire. I lived in the biggest city in new hampshire and i was just like this place is not inhabitable nobody should live here and i literally just sold all of my stuff and moved to california i'd never been there i didn't know anything about it i found a roommate on uh, a forum for motorcycles and i ride motorcycles on my way there and i was just like i'm never living anywhere that does this again <laughs> wow that yeah. is so crazy an inch and a half of ice <laughs> it was the, it was the it was insane. I've never seen anything like that before. It was so crazy. Yeah, I would move too at that point. Like, I would move too. <laughs> My yeah. God. But it's That's 80 insane. in Arizona today, so I'm, I'm happy. Yeah, it's, it's very tempting to go to Arizona. You know, I, um, my wife and I, we, we like, you know, colder weather. I, w I wouldn't say like, you know, insanely cold weather. Right. But we like prefer, you know, a, a, a good variation, you know, in the seasons yeah. and whatnot. And my buddy was telling me that like Flagstaff, Arizona mm -hmm. is a good like mix of the seasons. And so, yeah. you know, I'm, now I'm now I'm on the mission of like convincing my wife, like, hey, we should go check out, you know, Flagstaff, Arizona and see how it is. You know, like, yeah, now I'm on that yeah, 10 year mission. I can see snow from where I'm standing. So there's a mountain uh, outside. Of, I live in Tucson. There's a mountain just outside Tucson called Mount Lemon. that actually has a ski area. You can ski for like a couple months out of the year. And I can see it from like, so it's it may, it's less than an hour from my house to, to the mountain. So, I mean, oh, wow. you can get to cold weather if you really want to. You just don't have to live it. Like, I, I hate scraping my windshield. And it's, yeah. such, like, it's one of those stupid things that you're like, it's such a small thing to be like focused on, but it's just one of those things that it, it's like 7 15 in the morning and you're exhausted and you've only had a cup of coffee and you're trying to get to work and you're just like, I hate this. I hate everything. But then again, I've never burned my ass on a frozen windshield <laughs> <laughs> in Arizona half the year. Like, I literally have to keep it towel on my car seat so that I don't get second degree burns on my butt. So oh, yeah, straight uh, off to everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Jackie, you know, I, I'm really interested in hearing about how you got into IT. What made you want to go into IT overall? And then what made yeah. you want to, you know, maybe make a, a, I guess maybe a slight switch, right, into security and focus more on security? Yeah, so I had a really weird, like, meandering career. I've dropped out of college three or four times at least. Um, oh, jeez. Yeah, so I started with psychology, uh, dropped out because I was poor and could afford tuition. And I actually got a job as a stockbroker when I was 20. So I bullshitted my way through an interview and got hired by Fidelity. And so I worked as a stockbroker through the financial crisis, moved over to SVB uh, <laughs> and managed cash for companies. And so it was like, 
I had kids and I was doing the whole like quarter life crisis thing everybody does and like doing psychedelics and like questioning my existence on the planet. And I I got an economics and finance degree because I was working in finance and I really wanted to learn how to write Python. So I was like, well, what was the easiest way to learn how to write Python? I was like, well, I already understand economics and statistics. So maybe data science would be a good idea because it seems to be an up and coming field right now. Um, this is what, like 2017. Um, it is like, you know, also it would be applying Python to something I already understand. So I did data, a data science boot camp and I pushed my final project to my GitHub. Um, and this guy reached out to me and he said, Hey, I am the data science person at this sim startup. Um, uh, we're looking for somebody to write algorithms for like anomaly detection and user identity behavior analytics. Are you interested? And, uh, I had never really thought about working in cyber security. Security, which is weird because I was always like my mom used to drop me off at Radio Shack when she grocery shopped. So I've known how to use a computer since I was like three. Uh, and I always like, I don't know, it's so strange. And, like, I actually grew up in the military on a couple of intelligence bases. So I've always been kind of weirdly adjacent to security and those types of things. Um, but that's how I initially got into it. And then um, I think personally, um, one of the things I love about security is, uh, while the gender disparity isn't a good thing, the bathrooms are always clean for me, and there's never a line. So, like, that's a great... No, no, I find, I find more than anything, more than any industry I've worked in, security is very much a meritocracy, right? It is 100% a meritocracy, and it's a really interesting industry in that people don't actually need to like you, they just need to trust you. And so you have all of these crazy, like, neurodivergent, like, not necessarily super socially adept people, but I did like, it just felt like home as soon as I went to my first, like, DEF CON. You know, my first DEF CON was mind-blowing. It was like, oh, my God, these are my people. Like, and it's just like everybody kind of wants to solve the same problems. And um, I've always had problems in regular industries where people think I'm crazy because I don't think the way that neurotypical people think. Whereas in security, people are like, oh, your brain works differently than mine. Come help me with this problem because between the way your brain works and when... So it just seems to be an industry that's significantly more open to, like, everybody brings their own special talents. Um, yeah, and so I ended up moving from um, the... <laughs> ran an elementary school in my living room during the pandemic because I have three kids. Uh, and then after that, I was like, you know, how do I combine cybersecurity with my finance background and I ended up becoming an industry analyst. So I covered like Sims or XDR, all of those kind of like analytical platforms for S and P um, slash four or five one research. Um, and that was how Purple found me is uh, they pitched the company to me and I was like, I love this. Like, so I hate regex. It's like the bait of my existence because when I became a data scientist, nobody told me that before you can write an algorithm, you have to get this like, beast of a syslog file into something that you can actually use and there were no good tools for doing that at the time so i literally spent like weeks on regex when i was a data scientist so when i saw curve i was like this is amazing but at the time they were kind of calling it an observability pipeline um which is what it you know it was, it's great for but i was like, i don't know what observability really means i work in security <laughs> <laughs> Right. I always say, like, observability people know exactly how important their jobs are to security, but security people are kind of like, observability isn't that like. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so, but so I, that was a very long winded story, but I think it's important because I have not met many people in security who came here directly. Right. Like, we all have these like weird backgrounds, and like the diversity of background is usually what makes you good in security because. When you're dealing with, say, like a financial services client, you need to have some background in that to really understand the nature of the thrust that you're dealing with. So, um, yeah. Yeah, it's a really good point. You, you know, I have a lot of people reaching out to me, you know, constantly asking me, you know, how do I get into security and that sort of thing. Right. And they kind of want that, you know, 12, 18 month path into yeah. security. And, you know, I, I always tell them you don't want that path because security is so stressful and it requires so much context outside of security that yeah. you just simply wouldn't get, you know, if you if you went straight into security, um, yeah. you know, it, like the, the 
you know, like you said, right? Like you kind of have to know how fin- the financial industry works, the kinds of systems that they have in place, the methods and all that uh, to really, you know, kind of understand like, oh, okay, we're going to do security this way because we have this huge compliance standard with NYDFS that just came out that, you know, they're, they're going after companies for, it, right? So like, this is a hot priority item. You know, we need to get through it like this rather than this other, you know, industry recognized method that we've done forever, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, and I mean, uh, my just we were actually underwritten. I understand the statistics that an actuary uses, you know, and I can form opinions about this is the way the market is going. You know, right now we're underwriting enterprise value. I actually think we're going to move to a model where we underwrite the value of the actual data that's at risk. Um and part of that is bringing that background. And I agree. Like, I always tell people, like, your non, the non security background that you bring is what's really important. And I think we in the security profession could do a lot better job of building those bridges because I agree with you. I hate the, like, here's your 18 month blueprint into a tier one analyst role that's going to suck your soul out of you. <laughs> right? Because, like, well, because, like, that path is not going to get you into a really cool, interesting security game. It's going to get you into a tier one soft game, which is not a, not the best way, you know, to start out in security. Because a lot of times those are kind of burnature roles that are really stressful. Yeah. <laughs> like, not many. Not- but if you can be like, okay, well, I come from a, you know, a, manufacturing background right but i really understand the physical security aspect of manufacturing that's an entire like subset of security that is actually desperately in need of modernization so go go into it that way you know develop opinions on it but like and that's what i think a lot of times people are afraid to have an opinion but that's gotten me most of the best jobs i've ever had right is having like a a contrary opinion on something (laughs) yeah I, i feel like that's uh it's a pretty common, you know, attribute of security professionals is, is having an opinion on something that isn't, isn't the norm, isn't the expected, you know, opinion. And, you know, I, I, I kind of go back to like when my wife and I, we were building our house and, you know, figuring out where we wanted the rooms and everything like that. Right. Um, she wanted to have a more open you know, floor plan. And I'm thinking to myself, well, like that makes things too easy, you know, for, for a potential attacker, right? Like I'm thinking from a physical security perspective and I'm thinking yeah. like, you know, oh, I don't want a wall here because I want to put a camera there so I can have a wider view of range. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, like all of these things. And, you know, when we're finally in the house, she's like, oh, well, I like, you know, no, like no shades on the, on the window because it blocks the natural sunlight from coming in and whatnot. I'm like, well, one, we live in Chicago, so we get natural sunlight like four months of the year. Yeah. And two, you know, we're just opening our windows to attackers. And she's like, where do we live? Like, we live in a place that has literally zero crime. Like, yeah. Who are we yeah. protecting from? You know, but like my mind works totally different. My mind is like, like, nope. You know, worst case scenario, we already expect them to be here. You know, that sort of thing. And she yeah. has to like dial me back. Yeah, it's interesting too to think about uh, like how we think about security because like what you're talking about, like some of that is such actual security, and some of it is security theater. And it's really interesting to think about it like a post nine eleven world, right? Like a lot of like people under it's so crazy to think people under twenty five have never known a world without security theater. I mean, you didn't hmm. used to have a lot of that, and so I think some of that is like. There are things you do because they actually make you more secure. And then there are things you do because they present the illusion of security, right? Like TSA is security theater, because realistically, if somebody wants wants to run straight through those barricades with something, they can. And, you know, and and so, but I, it's interesting to think about that because we're in the same position and like, I shouldn't say that. I might not lock my doors at night. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Because I think it's like I've had I time my car. So for example, I used to have a convertible, right? I had my convertible three weeks in South San Jose, which is kind of the barrio, but before somebody cut the top and broke into it. And it's like oh. too grand for a new convertible top. So you know what I started doing? I just didn't lock my doors. Yeah. I just left my car unlocked all the time, put anything really important in the trunk, because I figured you know like and 
that top never got caught again. <laughs> It's like it's interesting to think about like what things are actually secure and what things aren't. Um, and I had a kid that I was reading a book the other day about also like our perception of security and how much more dangerous the world has become. But actually, statistically, the world's become quite a bit safer. You know, and the things that are more dangerous to us than they used to be are things like our diets. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we're talking about like nobody lets their kids watch school. Anymore. You know, yeah. there's this perception that, like, there's all these people out there who are going to snatch your kids. But realistically, kidnappings are, like, are down by more than 50% since 25 years ago. So, like, it, right. it's, a uh, yeah. But, I mean, yeah. the same thing in cybersecurity, right? Is like, people, we spend all spend billions of dollars on all this AI and this sophisticated detection. And it's literally just some dude in your mailroom that clicks on the wrong link that call or you're... Your HVAC system, you're using the default password for the system that operates all of your air handlers. Somebody gets in that way. It's like you can spend all the time in the world like spending all this money on stuff, but at the end of the day, it's usually the little things that that screw you over. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that that uh that reminds me of like the the Octa breach that recently fairly recently happened, right? Where you know someone just dialed into support. Or you know whatever it was the help desk, and they got access via that. And you know, Okta was was infamous for having you know, top notch security. Never really dealt with a breach like this before, you know, or anything like that. Um, and I think that they, I think they handled it fairly well, right? Um, yeah. Because I felt like I was getting the information, like I, I felt like I was getting the updates as they were getting them. You know, like, oh, we just found out a hundred percent was breached. Yeah. Sorry, like, yeah. you know, we just yeah. learned of it. You know, not like uh whatever whatever breach that was last pass, right? That like yes. was, oh, really gosh. frustrated me. Yes. Where it's like, yeah. oh, you know, they don't have anything. They got in, but they didn't they didn't get anything. Oh well, yeah. I, they got some stuff, you know, some of the stuff is unencrypted somewhere, right? They got some stuff, but you're fine. Oh, it turns out they got everything and your master password to your, you know, to your vault. Like, guys, you should have told yeah. me this six months ago. <laughs> yep. Yeah. How you handle a data breach is a lot more, like, obviously, the kind of data that's breached is really important. But how you handle it, like, I think about the 23 and Me, you know, breach. And I think that's kind of like on the polar opposite end where I haven't really heard a whole lot from them. And I just keep hearing, like... You know, to your point, like similar to last pass, it's like I haven't heard anything from them. Like all I've, the only thing I've seen in the press from them is that they still think they can be profitable as a company. And I'm like, how do you even if you could be profitable? I want right. to know where my DNA is. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know what? I mean, so I actually wrote when I was an industry analyst a couple of years ago. I wrote a, a paper, a white paper on zero trust, and that like zero trust is still you're creating a single point of failure, and if, and that's like it's we it's these push pull forces of convenience and security, right? And everybody wants to be super secure, but also we can't inconvenience people because if you inconvenience people with security measures, they find ways to circumvent them. So it's this constant battle of like, and Okta seems like a great idea, right? Because it's like, oh, it's all it's all encrypted. But again, single point of failure. And so, you yeah. know, it's, I, I see these things. And I think this, uh, the ISOO, uh, this most recent kind of takedown of Lockbit, uh, if you've read through any of the documents about the U.S., it's, they're basically like, hey, the U.S. has single points of failure, all over our infrastructure. The AT&T outage the other day really kind of drove that home for me. Uh, and, you know, because it wasn't just AT&T. Because if it's an AT&T downlink satellite area, it's all cell providers. A lot of people don't realize that, like, cell providers don't each have a tower. It's like they kind of choose each other's. And yeah, um, yeah so it, it's a really interesting thing to think about and how we go about managing that the kind of trade-off. And to me, I've always said, you know, security is really a culture. And so I think what we need to focus a lot more on is how do you just build security practices into your culture at your company? Um, because I could talk smack about them now because they look paper, so they can't sue me. But uh, <laughs> I went from fidelity to SVP. 
And Fidelity is one of the most conservative financial companies that exists, right? They're a boss of base. They're super, and when you're like your first day there, they're like, hey, FYI, compliance is your best friend. Like they are here to save your ass. They are not here to ruin your day. They're not here to make your job harder. And at SVB, it was kind of like compliance, just they, they had these two people running all of compliance. And when I got there, like lots of the stuff they were doing, I was like, I had a supervisory right. license and my supervisor didn't. And so I was like, we can't do most of this stuff, but it was like a check the box thing there. And security is the same way. And security and compliance kind of go hand in hand, right? And that it has to be a culture. Because if it's not just baked into everything everybody at your company does, and if they don't unquestioningly trust security to have their back and to ask stupid questions, to be able to send phishing emails before, like if I because a lot of times I think people make bad decisions because they're afraid to ask questions. They don't want to look stupid or admit that they don't know whether it's safe to click on an email or not, right? And so maybe what we do in we'll care a lot more is like how do we make security more accessible to non-technical people? And how do we just bake it into the corporate culture in most places where we focus more on like if having some so and this is I have this argument with people a lot. If having security policies in place prevents you from doing your job effectively, that's probably a procedure issue, not a policy issue, right? Like if the policy is really prohibitive, change the policy, but usually it's the way the policy is being implemented that people have a problem with. And so that's another thing that I'm really focused on is how do we separate policy from procedure and acknowledge that, yes, some of these things might add some more work, but we can really optimize the procedure by which we do that so that the policy is not prohibitive to your day-to-day work. If that makes sense. And I think like hmm. we're not design architects for security people, so we don't think about these things, but they have to start kind of going together the same way you would design UI for products to because it's it's not just technical people that get hacked, right? It's so yes. Yeah, that's um that's a it's an interesting balance that well, one, you probably wouldn't get if you went directly into security, right? So it kind of circles back to that. Yep. But you know that that's a it's a balance that actually I'm having to to deal with right now, right? Where I'm trying to deploy and enhance security controls and fall in line with security policies that my architects have created, but at the same time, I need to not create something so uh, restrictive or enforce something so restrictive within these applications that my devs can't do their work, and so I I have to actually work you know, very closely with the business that with people that are much smarter than me that, you know, lawyers. speak four languages and coding, <laughs> right. You know, like yeah. lawyers, compliance, um, mm-hmm. you know, basically everyone. So just to make sure that the organization is not just secure, but that everyone in the org can do their job as they expect to do it, you know, and that they've been doing it that way. Yeah. And it's a, it's a challenging balance for sure. Yeah. Do you find it also challenging to have to tie the stuff you're doing to like broader corporate initiatives to keep yeah. yourself relevant? <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, that that's like, um, I, I guess in my most recent role, you know, that that's been a more of a focus, right? Of, of me taking more and more ownership of, I'm basically a manager or a director without the title, right? <laughs> like the title is engineer. But all the stuff I'm doing, like my manager even says, he's like, yeah, all the stuff you're doing is, you know, director level role stuff, right? Like I'm managing my budget. I'm, you know, putting out, you know, company wide notifications and things like that, right? All the people I'm communicating with. And it's a learning curve for sure. <laughs> like that is, I mean, I just spent like the last four, five months trying to figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's kind of where you, Everybody, everybody, I think, who matures in their career goes through this process where all of a sudden you realize that, like, you have to think like the CEO, even if you're working in, because if you want to get something funded, if you want to get people to pay attention to it, if you want, you know, if you want it to be more than just your pet project, like it has to tie into these kind of broader company initiatives. And um, so we, I was actually talking with one of my friends about setting up like a CISO training um, thing at one of our uh, corporate events that we're doing. And I was like, you know, I think you should do improv comedy. 
like do an mm. improv comedy class because one of the things I find is that people in security are really not good at public speaking. And so like you not only have to be able to understand what you're doing as a security leader, you have to be able to articulate it to vastly different audiences, right? The way you explain what you're doing to the CFO is different than the CEO is different than the CTO. And then you also have to be able to get up in front of people who are going to pepper you with questions and be able to answer those questions. And I like, I don't think that's necessarily something that people anticipate when they go into security, that it, when you get to a certain point in your career, all of a sudden, it, it almost seems like all of a sudden you have to become a significantly more robust professional than you did when you were just doing like, detection response <laughs> yeah yeah it's a really good point you know the i always talk about or i try to on this podcast talk about the things that kind of separate you right from from other people and the reason why i do that is because those separation those i guess those separation points you know make you stand out more and when you stand out more hopefully it's in a good way you know you get promoted you get the opportunities that others don't get and, that, you know, you approached it from, from, you know, let's do improv. To me, improv would be very scary. I think I'm a funny person, but I am not improv funny, you know. Um, that, yeah. that would be terrifying for me. But, <laughs> and then we just have a bunch of people in like a feeble position crying on stage. Be right. <laughs> right. But, you know, what one of you said, you know, they struggle with public speaking, right? Or speaking to other people that they don't know or whatnot, right? And this was also an issue for me, you know, several years ago before I started this podcast. And somehow I got this idea to start a podcast and I couldn't get it out of my head. So here I am, right? Like over 150 <laughs> episodes in. And, you know, you came on here, there was no prep. It was like, hey, this person's name is Joe. He runs this podcast, you know? And then like the same thing for me, like, this person's name is Jackie. She's from Cribble. This is what they do. There's no questions, you know, anything like this. If you go back five years ago, the thought of this conversation taking place would have given me a lot of anxiety. But now, <laughs> you know, it, it's nothing, right? Like, we're just having yeah. a conversation. No, it's a muscle. And that's like, so improv was terrifying for me, too, like when I first did it. The number one rule of improv is yes and. Which is basically no matter what the person before you says, you have to agree with it and add to it. So, and it, it's actually a really good lesson for how you should live your life because I do some crazy stuff in my life. Like I love music festivals and traveling and I've, I've done all kinds of crazy stuff on purpose and accidentally. And it's always because when somebody's like, hey, do you want to do this thing? I'm like, yes. And we should also do this, which would make it even more epic. Right. And so that's kind of like, I in so on in Cribble, we have my team is very small, but the people who make content, we call ourselves team F it will do it live. Because oh. same thing, like almost no live streams we do. Like I'm usually finishing the slides for whatever thing we're about to do as we're starting the introduction on the recording. <laughs> but I think to your point, it's a muscle and it's a muscle you have to exercise. And the other thing, like the thing you figure out is that we all, we all have this like critical and fear of failure. Um, and I guess in my career, I've been really fortunate that I have screwed up so badly, so publicly a few times that I have failed in the most epic ways you can imagine. And it turns out that like none of your family stops loving you. None of your friends stop hanging out with you. <laughs> nobody <laughs> thinks you're like, nobody thinks you're an all worthless person. So, um, you know, you fall on your face a couple of times and you're like, oh, it's not that bad. You know, this podcast wasn't the best one I ever recorded, but. Maybe next week's will be better. You know, and like everybody in your life is like, nobody cares. And that, that's the kind of thing that I figured out is like, both the, the work you do is extremely important, right? Having this podcast, having a resource for people who really need it is both extremely important and extremely inconsequential at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> so I think once you figure that out, it makes life a lot easier to know. Right. Yeah. You, you bring up a lot of really good points there. Um, you know, with, with having, you know, I, f I feel like it's so important to have, I, I don't want to call it a safe space, but you need to have a space where you can fail constantly in, in tech. You know, like one of my first jobs out of college, I mean, I dropped a bank's database 
the like I, I didn't even know the term drop, right? Like I accidentally deleted this customer's database and they were a bank. And then I spent the next, you know, two days, right, fixing it and restoring it from logs that I didn't even know could be restored from and you know, all this sort of stuff. They didn't lose any data. They had no downtime, right? But I still dropped their production database. And, you know, in a, yeah. in a lot of companies, on a lot of teams, it's like immediate termination. Like, okay, you don't know what the hell you're doing. Like, get out of here. You know, but I was also very open in the interview. Like, hey, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. <laughs> you yeah. know, like, I need to be taught, you know? And that was a huge learning moment. But, mm -hmm. like, and, and that's just one of, like, a hundred you know, situations that I was in at that company alone, right? And so I developed, you know, the greatest troubleshooting doc ever at that company. It's literally still in use where, yeah. you know, when someone encounters a random problem, they just go look at my doc because I guarantee you I've encountered it. And there's a whole section of SE Linux. And before I encountered SE Linux there, I never touched it. I didn't know it existed. Literally, one of my customers was a federal agency, and he said, "Hey, we need to turn on SE Linux, you know, on this server." And I was like, "Okay, turn it on. What's the problem?" He goes, "No, yes. it breaks everything." I was like, "Well, yeah. that's weird, you know." And then I went down this <laughs> rabbit hole for three months of knowing way more about SE Linux than I ever wanted to, you know. Yeah. Um, it's it's really interesting, and then you know, you bring up the the yes and perspective from improv. And I actually do that with like all of my trips, you know, that I'm planning a trip to, to London for my first time uh, in the fall. And I'm going with a friend, I'm, I'm bringing my wife and my, my one year old. And, you know, he, he, he comes from a different background, I guess, of doing trips, right, where they kind of plan everything around food. And, you know, everything else kind of like falls into place, I guess. I am the complete opposite. I am like, like, no, like we're going on this bus tour. We're going to get off. We're going to go have drinks here. Like all of it, you know, because when I go somewhere new, it's like, well, let's do everything. Like, yeah. I'm not here to sleep. Like if they're open at 4 a.m., like, let's go at 4 a.m. Like, I do not care, you know? Yeah. And it's the same thing I did with my Germany trip last year was, you know, every day was another adventure. Like one day we were in the mountains going through castles for the entire day, walked an entire marathon. I was dead tired at the end of it. And, you know, the next day was a football game, right? Like went to the football game, did a full day of drinking. You know, I got to see my buddy not keep up. That was fantastic. You know, like <laughs> the whole thing, you know, it's, um, it's that ability to just want to keep going. You know, want to yeah. keep exploring and pushing and seeing what else is out there, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And I've, I've just kind of always been like that. I think some of it is that I grew up super sheltered. So like, mm. we were poor and I was homeless when I was 19. Like I so I never got to go anywhere. Like we went on like two trips that I can remember as a kid. So when I was finally an adult and making a lot of good money because I was working in finance, it was like, I want to do all the things i want to do everything like there's no reason not to try anything because i didn't get to do anything when i was a kid and i always had like i've always had health issues so i've also always had this kind of like my clock might be ticking faster than other people so i need to do all the stuff you know before mm. you know before i run out of time and health to do it so that yeah, i just i i feel like everybody's so one of the interesting things I've also found is that, like, I used to think that everybody's idea of happiness was roughly the same. And I think that as I've grown as an adult, I figured out that we're all wired completely differently. Like, everybody's brain is wired differently. And what brings people happiness and joy is completely different from one person to another. It's like growing up in New Hampshire, I still have friends who live within 10 miles of where we graduated from high school we were married to somebody that we went to high school with. <laughs> you know, like they've literally never been. I have a friend who's never been west of Tennessee because they live in wow. New Hampshire, like doesn't have a passport, but they're happy and or ish. Um, and so like, if I don't know, I just think that I know I'm ADHD 
I know I'm autistic. So I know that my brain has like a 40% higher need for stimulation and activity than most people's. Um, yeah, like I'm all about like maximizing the ROI for every moment I'm awake because like, I think that's just how ADHD brains work, right? We're like human mm-hmm. optimization machines. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You gotta, I don't know. Like I'm, I, I don't know if I'm ADHD, but you know, I, I find that I have to, at the minimum, I have to have a goal, you know, at all times. Right. And I need to be making progress towards it. And I have different ways of, kind of tracking that progress and whatnot, right? Because when I don't have that, I start, I don't know, I like start going off the deep end, right? And I'm like no longer focused. It's very easy for me to get into that spiral, right? <laughs> but of, you like, don't not, know if you have an ADHD, right? <laughs> right, you know? I guess I've never <laughs> been tested or whatever. <laughs> I didn't get tested until like three or four years ago. Um it was crazy too because it's like a list of 25 things that you thought were like character flaws about yourself and all of a sudden you find out like oh it's actually not that i'm human garbage it's actually just that my brain is wired differently than other people's (laughs) right (laughs) yeah it's interesting i feel like as as time goes on i just figure out how more like different everyone is you know and how yeah. how different everything is you know and how to appreciate that it's um <clears throat> it's an interesting thing that i i kind of recently went down i guess but you know can we, well, it's, can we it's really well so it's really important with regard to ai to understand how different people are and so to actually talk about something technical here One of the really interesting things I've been thinking and researching a lot about is diversity as it relates to artificial intelligence and as it relates to technology in general. um, And so I think all the times that people, and I'm going to go on kind of a tangent, people think of DEI as like a PR thing or like it's a moral issue and like, yes, morally we should all hire diversely and hire every candidates, but it's actually also just a technology usability issue because if you don't want a world that's primarily built to serve mostly male, mostly white men, then you can't have mostly male, mostly white men building all of the technology. And this that sounds kind of, you know, like a, a political stance, but it's really not in that so... If you take the politics out of pronouns, right, and you don't like and we we ignore who, you know, we want to argue over whether there should be more than two pronouns. Well, guess what? In the Thai language, there's like 20 something because in the Thai language, your pronoun encompasses what you were born as, what you currently identify as and who you like to date. And so when we're talking about something like generative AI, when we're trying to talk about canonical inferences and being able to um, understand text. If we don't want generative AI to only be a utility and helpful for English speaking people, then it can't just be written by English speaking people. And so another example is like English and Spanish are both romantic languages, but the way you say I love something and I have something are the same in Spanish. So this comes into play when you're talking to a generative, like I'm putting prompts into Gen AI. If I say, uh, let's say here, Caro Tacos, how does that generative AI know whether I'm giving it a piece of factual information and saying, I love tacos, because take care of tacos means I love tacos romantically, right? Or Caro Tacos meaning I want tacos. And that actually makes a big difference with you because one of those is input and one of those is requesting output, right? If you're saying, I want this, you may be requesting to get that thing back. And so uh, diversity, another place this comes into play is uh, hardware. So hardware is predominantly built for male frames. So when you think about something like the Apple Vision Pro causing a lot of women and smaller frames people massive migraines, it's probably because the people who designed, built, and tested that were all skewed towards a specific population. So I, this is one of the things I think is really interesting to think about in that Diversity in technology is not just important because in a utopian world, that's how it would be. It's important because it's going to make, it's going to determine whether or not technology is only useful for a small group of people. And that's important, right? So um, I 
The Hugging Face, shout out The Hugging Face, is a nonprofit that's super dedicated to democratizing machine learning and AI. Um, and I'm like, those are things that I'm really passionate about because we're, we have a technology that has the ability to fundamentally transform the way humans live and to provide benefits that a large percentage of our population has never had before, but we can only get there if we build it so that it works for all people, right? Yeah, it's a really good point, you know, and I've I've had on like AI researchers before and I talked about this where, you know, you like, how do you ensure, right, that the AI has enough diversification of its data and how it's, you know, making its choices and if it, you know, hurts a certain group of people or disadvantages a certain group of people or, you know, whatever it might be, right? Um, like, how do you protect against that? And how do you have, you know, potentially, you know, like a, I don't know, like a, like a base set of language or a base AI model, right? That this other AI model can check itself against is like, oh, did I make the right decision here? You know, like that's where the people come in, I guess. But, um, it's, it's a really, it's a fascinating area because, you know, as humanity has evolved, we've never encountered something like this before. You know, it's never been, it's never been a thing that anyone ever really thought about. You know, it's never been a thing where we thought about like, is Google, you know, serving me the right, you know, search results, right? Based on, I don't know where I live or whatever, right? Um, those things have never come up before. It's really interesting where we take it because this will, you know, like you said, like this will really have the capability of like advancing, you know, civilization as a whole, you know, like this can either go really well or it could probably go really bad. Hopefully yeah. it goes really well. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And that's, it's something that I think that, you know, it, I, I don't tend to be as much of a doomsdayer as, um, a lot of AI people are like they do potential. I do see the potential for things to get out of control, but also just like a bucket of water, right? Like, <laughs> uh, you just throw a bucket of water on it. Uh, no, but I, what I do, I think it's it's something that we need to. There's this phenomenon that I've always encountered in tech where everybody assumes that somebody else smarter than them is focused on this problem on any problem, on any any equity problem that you bring up in tech, like I think most people always assume there's someone else who's going to deal with that, like, because somebody smarter has already thought of that. A lot of times, like, seriously, nobody's brought it up. Like, there are some large technologies that have been released that people are like, oh, what about this? And oops, like, uh, I remember the I think it was the one of the Apple Watches that was released. Like the Apple Watch, the face of it was too big for like forty percent of women's wrists. Yes. <laughs> and actually, I have comically small wrists anyway, but I have the same issue with like this is not what this watch was intended to look like, right? So I mm. literally have. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like I think everybody was assuming somebody else is doing this, and as the world becomes more complex that phenomena will probably increase. So I think one of the big questions we have to have is how do you put in place checks and balances to make sure that someone actually is thinking about these things? And how do you try to control, like we're also trying to make regulations at like a state and even country level and data and technology is global. So the other thing is like, there's all these different NGOs that are trying to do things. So we have to come to a place where we're coordinating these things a lot more closely so that everybody is kind of aware of the state of technology, the ideals, you know, what we're working towards. Cause it seems like a lot of this stuff, some of these decisions about, you know, do we make it more equitable or do we make more profits are being made behind closed doors. So I think there needs to be clearer expectation set for when one of these paradoxes comes up that has the, potential to impact a large number of people whose decisions aren't just being made by a small group of people and they're being made in a public way. Yeah, I think you bring up a great point, right? Is that it's very easy for us to kind of assume or think that, you know, someone has already thought of this, they're already working on this, they're already doing X, right? Um, which really isn't always the case. And it's it's probably happening a lot less than what you would expect. 
And the difference, right? Someone may even have the same exact idea, but the difference is if you act on it. It's actually, it's if you actually do something with it. And that's, you know, that that's the important part. That's honestly, that's what separates, you know, I, I would say, you know, the, the people that you hear about, that's what separates them from everyone else is that they get an idea and then they find a way to make it work. Like, however, whatever that looks like, whatever that takes, you know, they just find a way to make it work. Um, and I feel like as technology professionals, we, we kind of like got to get out of our own heads, you know, with that, because we're so analytical by, by default, right. That, you know, we'll overthink something for years before actually moving when it's like, Hey, you should have done this like 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like how many times has this technology come out? You're like, oh man, I had the idea for that like 10 years ago. And it's like, yeah, but you didn't do anything about this issue. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. And everybody always assume. And that's like, people, so many people underestimate their power. And this is the thing that I, I so when I came into security, and here's, here's the thing, we're all talking, we're talking about how great it is to get into security from other industries, but we should acknowledge that when you do get into security, if you're new in the industry, it's really easy to feel like an imposter or feel like an outsider or feel like you're faking it because you're really somewhere. But that goes back to what I was talking about with insecurity. I found that people don't really necessarily need to like you. They just need to trust you. And I've earned a lot more respect from my peers by being really clear on where my skills end than demonstrating those skills themselves, right? Because I, I come into a room full of security engineers. I mean, these people can hack your router in four minutes, you know, with a fluker zero. Like, I, I'm i not that. I'm a data scientist. And I only worked as a data scientist applying to security for a little over a year. So I, but I know that what I lack in actual technical ability to pop your Tesla's gas door, like I make up for in my ability to communicate. So like my superpower is communication and translation. I can take, I can sit down with your security engineers and they can dump on me all of the technical stuff that they're doing. And I can take that and make it into a story you can tell your customers. I can make it into a story you can tell your marketing team, your sales team. And so like there's a lot of different skills required around security to make a security program successful like communication like marketing like training like because there's a big difference between knowing how to do something and knowing how to teach somebody else how to do it so i was a facilitator for a long time another communication job right so it's it's important to acknowledge that you may feel like a fish out of water if you get into security or you join a new industry but you need to understand that your ability to know your limits and to say, hey, I've actually never had experience with that, but it's something I'd like to learn more about. Where can I read about that? Like, People will respect you 10 times more for doing that than for immediately bullshitting an answer because you feel like you should have one. Yeah, I've always found there to be a lot of value when you're, you know, more honest, more open, more upfront about your own limitations, you know, because um, people will keep I guess kind of kind of drilling you or drilling you, especially in security in the security world, you know, as soon as you say like, oh yeah, I've done this for 10 years or I'm an expert in this, I built this. I mean, in security, it's like, okay, well, guess what? I, I understand what that is and let's talk about it. <laughs> you know, like we're going to talk about it at a level that like, if you didn't build it yourself, you're not going to know, you know, and uh, I've, I've been on both sides of that in interviews, right? Where, where I've said, you know, I'm an expert in something and they just completely grill me on it. And, you know, thankfully, like I've gotten past it because, you know, what I put on my resume is the stuff that like I have done, you know, I'm not like really? bluffing it. I may use words that I may like rarely use, you know, because like, you know, you don't want to use the same like verb or adverb or whatever it is, you know? adjective to describe something right but like when i say like hey i built this thing it's like no i i actually built it like you know yeah because i really don't want to be in a situation where someone points out a point and i can't answer it at length you know yeah Oh, we've all been through the experience of seeing like an ex coworkers LinkedIn and seeing all the shit (laughs) that we did that they're taking credit for and you're like oh really you made that happen huh yeah yeah yeah, no, like weird. I don't remember you on that project. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Then did you ever really call that the George Santos effect now? Is that <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I, I think that's true. Like there's a lot of power in saying I don't know. Like there's a lot of like there's a lot of risk in saying it if you're the one who's supposed to know. But in a lot of circumstances, you're not the person who's supposed to know. And I'm you know, like people aren't looking to you to have all the answers, they're looking to you to know where to go to find them. Uh, yeah, and that's the kind of what your utility as a security professional usually is. It's like, I don't know everything, but I have a process that I can go through or I can quickly get to the information that I need, process it, and get it back in the form we can use. Yeah, that, that's a that's a key distinction there. You know, being able to say, I don't know, and then also following up with, but I can find out. Yeah, you know, like yeah. in today's, you know, modern age, right, 2024, like, you can absolutely find something out if you don't know it, you know, by a simple Google search. You don't have to go to the library anymore and hopefully they have a book on it, right? Um, so, like, there's no reason why you can't, you know, say that and actually follow up with it with the real information. Well, you know, J- Jackie, we've we've gone this entire time and uh, definitely doesn't feel like 50 minutes, that's for sure. But... You know, I'm, I'm, I try to be very conscious of everyone's time and, you know, I, I don't want to go over because I know that we're all booked, you know, meeting after meeting. So, you know, before I let you go, how about you tell my audience, you know, where they can find you, where they can find Cribble if they want to learn more and maybe they want to reach out. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm big on LinkedIn. So LinkedIn slash Jackie's Insecurity. Uh, you can interpret that whichever way you want to. Uh, <laughs> um and uh, Cribble, you know, we love it, Cribble.io, uh, or you can also follow Cribble on LinkedIn. We have a fantastic social media manager who makes some pretty high quality memes. Um, and, you know, I we didn't talk a ton about what Cribble does, which is I, my preference because I think that it's a, a product that is much better for people to do and use. But uh, if you have questions about moving data, making use of data, any of those things, you're more than welcome to reach out uh, to myself or anybody else on the Cribble team. Awesome. Well, thanks, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this episode.